All right. I'm glad so many of you stayed. Uh, so I guess thank you for staying. Um, so let's go into part two. Part two will be more focused on computation and applications. And towards the end, we'll touch on uh, some of the modern and recent applications of optimal transport in machine learning. So uh, stick around for that, I guess, if that's what interests you. All right, so here's a quick, quick overview of what we're gonna do. So we spent quite a bit of time defining what the optimal transport problems were and properties of their solutions, et cetera, but we didn't really talk anything about performing the actual computation, right? And that's obviously an important part for practice. And so we'll talk about exact computation, but also approximate computation. I'll focus specifically on one kind of approximation, um, uh, but we'll be happy to chat about other ones too, if you're interested. But this has really been the, the kind of key to the success of optimal transport recently, that we now have access to fast approximate solvers, uh, for some problems anyway, not all yet. So when we are interested in applying these tools in practice, it's important to think about the statistical properties of the resulting procedures, right? So we'll talk a little bit about that. We'll also talk about some of the statistical properties briefly uh, of the estimators that you might get from optimal transport when you use it as a loss function for some kind of learning task. And here there are a lot of open problems still. So I'll point out a couple that might be interesting to you. Um, and uh, the application will be on generative models. Uh, in particular, I'll, I won't go too deeply into it, but uh, I'll, I'll mention uh, some active research or uh, a group that I know is doing active research on image generation, for example, stuff like that. All right, so here's the recap. I promise I won't dwell more on these problems, at least not in these, these forms. Recall the primal problem, right? This is where we started. This was the problem that Kantorovich formulated. And we spent some time thinking about the corresponding dual problem, which is a maximization problem that happens to achieve uh, at its maximum the same value as the primal problem, right? So this gives us two angles of attack when trying to calculate one of these two values. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. But I guess you can already see here that this looks like a difficult thing to compute in practice, right? First of all, you have to do integration with respect to these measures. Those measures can be very complicated. And then we have to maximize over some set of L1 functions that are uh, co connected in kind of a, it's not that ugly, but it's not the, not the nicest thing to try and solve in practice, right? So we have to start with something easier. Uh, and the perhaps most important case, at least in applications, and also happens to be the case that's most amenable to computation, is calculating optimal transport cost between discrete measures. And so by discrete measures, I mean that mu, here in blue, is uh, um, supported at points xi, where i goes from 1 to n, and xi is assigned a weight ai. So AI, A here is a probability vector. So all these entries are non-negative, positive, you can take them to be here, uh, and they sum to one. Nu is analogous, but there's a, a nu is centered at locations Y and has a corresponding probability vector B. So these are two discrete measures. So in this particular case, we can say, or we can describe the set of couplings between mu and nu uh, more, I guess, directly. The set of couplings between mu and nu are the matrices with n by m matrices with positive entries, such that its row sums, that's what this is, is equal to the vector a, and its column sums are equal to the vector b. 
right? So this pi then represents a joint distribution, right? Which has as its first marginal the probability vector A and the second marginal the probability vector B. And if we denote by the matrix C with entries Cij the cost function, so here we're kind of removing the, the dependence on the data space directly by just summarizing the cost, the pairwise costs between the x's and the y's into this matrix C. The Kantorovich problem can be expressed this way. Right? You minimize over these matrices with positive entries that have the correct marginals. Uh, and this total cost is exactly analogous to the total cost we just described earlier. Yeah, do you agree? I'll sometimes use this shorthand notation just because this is the, you can think about this as the inner product between the matrix C and the, and the matrix pi. Everyone on board so far? Good. And we can similarly describe uh, the dual problem or make a reduction of the dual problem, right? We're, we're maximizing over two functions, well, really they're, they're vectors in this case. We're maximizing over the inner product between uh, phi and A, this is the integral basically for these discrete measures. And this is the same thing for psi and B. And the constraint now reads like this, right? And perhaps from this formulation in particular, it it's easy, easy to see that this is a linear program, right? This objective function is linear, and these constraints here are, uh, or these, these inequalities here are linear. So, from that realize it, yeah. Here, it doesn't need to be a distance. Here, we're back into the, back to the general optimal transport problem. So some notion of cost, uh, it might be easier to think about C as just a distance, but it doesn't have to be. They can be costs that incorporate, I don't know, imagine the setting that Kantorovich was thinking about when he was wanting to move troops. I mean, it can be uh, some notion of cost that incorporates the distance they have to travel, the fuel they have to use, the food they have to eat, the morale that they lose from having to move great distances during, you know, in freezing temperatures, which they had to do. All of that can be incorporated into the cost function. So that's you as a scientist have to figure out that cost function. Exactly. Yeah. Over pi matrices, researching over entries of the pi matrices where pi is constrained to have these, these properties. Yes, so that's, that's this problem. So um, you could use your favorite linear program solver and plug, plug this in, but let's think a little bit more carefully about what the nature of the solution looks like. So since it's a linear program, and this set is non-empty. That was the first theorem that we, we, uh, we uh, proved that there exists a solution, right? So this, this set has to be, or there is a feasible solution. This exists, sorry. This is not even uh, getting there. We don't have to need any theorems for this. This is non-empty just by, by definition. Take the product measure, for example, like that. It's also bounded, right? Because these are probability measures. So those matrices have to be bounded in some way. Because of these, the minimum of KP, the Kantorovich problem, is attained at an extremal point of this set. And this is, comes from some uh, important result from linear programming, and this, I guess, is the st standard reference for that kind, of, that kind of stuff. So at least that narrows it down a little bit. We know what values to search over, I guess. But how can we characterize these kind of extreme, these extremal points more carefully? Well, let's uh, reformulate this problem into, or there's an equivalent formulation of, uh, of this problem uh, in the form of a network flow problem. And I'll briefly uh, uh, 
introduce that for you. So suppose we have two sets of vertices, one to n and one to m. This represents, you know, these or these two sets of nodes represent the indices of the first distribution and the second distribution. And uh, let E be the set of directed edges that point that, that pair up an index from from mu with an index from nu. Uh, then the graph, which is the union of these two sets and these sets of edges, is the bipartite graph between D and D prime. Right? We have these two, two kind of uh, uh, separate populations in this graph, and they're connected by these edges. And any coupling uh, between mu and nu corresponds to a flow over this graph where ai, the value ai, flows out of node i into uh, the nodes j primed, uh, and those are constrained to have the value bj flowing into them. And so in this language, there's a neat formulation of the extremal points of this, uh, of this set. So if it is an extremal, if, it is an ex if pi is an extremal point of uh, the set of couplings, and you take f to be the subset of edges such that pi is positive along that edge, then the graph, the, the graph restricted to have only these edges, has no cycles. Right? If you're a person who works with graphs uh, more often than I do, this might be a natural condition or something that makes sense to you. But let's look at a picture. So here we have uh, mu being uh, just a distribution supported on three values. And the first value represented here by this node at probability 0 0.3, the second one 0.5, and the third one 0 0.2. And these, the thicknesses of these lines represent how much mass flows from this uh, node into the other nodes, right? On the other side, we have B, and so uh, into node four prime, for example, we have to have 0.56 amount of the mass flowing into it, right? And so this, this corresponds to a particular pi, right? You can think about these edges here as being, or the, the thickness of this uh, edge as representing the amount of joint probability mass between the index three and the index four prime. Does that make sense to you? Right, so the thickness, the thicker this thing is, the more likely is it that we set mass from two to four, for example, then maybe compared to two to one, right? So this, this uh, is a joint distribution. It happens to be feasible, but it's not optimal. It's not optimal because we can find a cycle. And the result earlier said that if a joint distribution is optimal, we shouldn't be able to find any cycles in this graph. And so where, where does the cycle arise? Well, we can go from this one to this one primed, to this two, down to this four, and then back to the one. Right? So there's a cycle here. There are other ones as well, but that's at least one. Okay, so that's, now we've narrowed down the set of possible solutions even further. And from this kind of network formulation of the problem, uh, it might not be surprising to you that you can work with algorithms that act on networks uh, to solve this problem. In particular, you can solve the problem with a net network simplex algorithm. That's too much stuff to go through uh, to describe the network simplex algorithm in this context. But if you read chapter three of this book by Perry and Kuturi, they have a very nice introduction to it. Sorry. But one thing that's interesting to note is that this acts in the primal, right? So it maintains, as it goes through uh, the algorithm, it maintains some feasible primal solution, right? And then it makes improvements on this, this solution. And you can prove that it finishes in finite time and all that, or that it finishes at least. I don't know enough about the details. But this is quite distinct from 
some other algorithms that, were, uh, that you can use to solve this problem. For example, you can compute uh, the optimal dual potentials corresponding to the discrete optimal transport problem with dual ascent methods. Uh, and so these act in the dual space, as the name suggests, right? We maintain a set of feasible phi and psi and perform improvements to these. So there's a set of algorithms that can be used to solve this exactly. But let me illustrate one thing for you by considering this special case. So in the setting where n is equal to m, so we have two distribution with the same amounts, uh, same number of points, and the weight, the probability assigned to each of those points is equal, it's just one over n. So this is, think about a standard empirical, two standard empirical distributions uh, with mass at two different sets of data then this kind of thing would apply. Then Urkov's theorem says that an extremal point of the set of couplings between these two guys happens to be uh, the set of permutation matrices. And so in this case, the Kantorovich problem reduces to just looking over the set of permutations, right? permutation matrices, but uh, you can reduce it to just looking over the set of permutations. Where we're looking for now a pairing for each i, we're looking for a uh, looking to pair it up with a J, uh, a unique J, and we're, hope we're doing this for each I, right? And we want to minimize the total cost. So this is also called a matching problem. It's very important in economics and a bunch of other fields. And because of this structure, we can solve it with a special case of a dual ascent method called the Hungarian algorithm, which I'm sure many of you know more about than me. But one thing to note is that this costs n cubed on the order of n cubed operation, which is quite expensive, right? At least if you're imagining having data sets with, I don't know, ten, tens of thousands of entries or something like that. And this was also the, for a long time, the reason why uh, practical, practical applications of optimal transport in fields like statistics and machine learning uh, wasn't really feasible we were hindered by computational cost. Uh, at least that's one reason why. There are other reasons, but uh, this perhaps was the main, main barrier. And so there is a need for approximate solvers. And there are a bunch of them, but the one I'll focus on is called entropic reg regularization of the optimal transport problem, because I personally find it to be a very interesting problem in its own right. Uh, it's actually an active research area of mine. It turns, it turns out that in a more general form, it's a special case of what's called the Schrodinger bridge problem, um, which uh, I spent quite a bit of my time thinking about. Uh, and it also happens to be perhaps the most, or the, 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 the paper or the method that sort of started the revolution, if you will, if we can call it a revolution, but you know started the movement, I guess. Um, so what is entropic regularization of the optimal transport problem? This you'll recognize just as the Kantorovich, the, the, the part of the objective in the, that comes from the Kantorovich problem, right? And so we're still minimizing this guy over the same set, but we're adding some penalty to being uh, far away from the product measure, right? So what is this gonna do to the solution? Well, it's probably gonna encourage it to be more diffuse in some way, right? It's gonna be the, 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 the product measure is in some sense the most entropic, no, no, not really, I'm not using these terms uh, very carefully, but most entropic joint distribution uh, in this set. So we're encouraging uh, our minimizer to be closer to the product measure than the solution of the uh, optimal transport problem is. And this allows, or this induces some regularity in, into the problem. This makes it smoother. This makes it more diffuse in some sense. In particular, this guy is one strongly complex, the KL here. And since we're multiplying with, with an epsilon, the 
uh, epsilon uh, entropic optimal transport problem is epsilon strongly convex. Since it's strongly convex, there is a unique mi minimizer. Right, so that's already kind of a regularization of the, of the, or something, a property that we didn't have always in the Kentorovich problem. We don't always have unique mi minimizers there. Uh, it's a pretty well behaved approximation in the sense that uh, you would hope. So if you take epsilon, the penalty to go to zero, you can show that the minimizers of this problem, or the minimum value rather, of this, this problem converges to the minimum value of the Kentorovich problem. If this is indeed to be a useful approximation, we should at least expect this, right? And this unique, the set of unique solutions as epsilon goes to zero converge to what is a feasible and optimal solution to the optimal, to, to the Kentorovich optimal transport problem. So this says that it's feasible, this says that it's optimal, but it converges to a particular one. It converges to the one that happens to be, uh, have the smallest KL divergence with the product measure, right? Which is not too surprising given that that's what we penalized. So th does this make sense to you? Do th these properties make sense to you? And does it make sense that or does it make intuitive sense that that's what we should expect just looking at the problem? If this penalty is tiny, 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 then we perhaps expect uh, the, the value of this to be close to the value of the optimal transport problem, et cetera, right? Yes? Only under some conditions, right? So the uniqueness results that we quoted uh, was, a specific, uh, was a specific case where uh, well, first of all, it was on a continuous space, and uh, we had uh, some continuity with respect to the meg measure of one of the measures, and there were some, some nice properties that we relied on in this case. So in general, there is no unique solution to the, to the optimal transport problem. I can give you an example. So suppose that I have uh, two distributions like this, that are equidistant, right? So it costs me equally much to transport this mass to the, the, there as it does to here, and similarly with this guy. And so there are two possible uh, optimal transport maps in this case. You all see that? So no, in general, it's not, not unique, but in some cases, we can establish uniqueness. you could still have a situation like this. So the cost that I was thinking about here is also the squared Euclidean distance, right? This point, so suppose that this has probability 0.5, this has probability 0.5, this has probability 0.5, and this has probability 0.5, and this is a distribution and that's a distribution. And this point, uh, these points are equidistant, right? This is as far as away from this as this is from that. Then you could still achieve the transportation in two different ways that are both optimal, right? You could move this point here and this point there, or you could move this point here and this point there. And so you would have two different solutions to the optimal transport problem. Does that make sense? Cool. So for discrete measures, no. Uh, for, for the continuous setting that we were talking about earlier, where we have some nice continuity with respect to the, to the big measure, you can indeed establish uniqueness. And so that's a, that's a major result. It's sometimes called the Brenier theorem, but it was generalized by McCann in the 90s, and it was one of the most exciting results about optimal transport uh, in the 90s. Still is very exciting, if you ask me. Thanks. Yeah? Yes. Yes, that the, uh, yes, under quite weak conditions, we can establish that they are, the, the dual and the primal attain the same value. There's no gap between them. Between. That's what we, what we uh, you mean solutions that act in the dual space? Yes, yes. In particular, this Hungarian algorithm is a dual ascent method. Ah, so this is the special case of the Munch problem. 
this problem here. It's kind of the simplest discrete optimal transport problem you can think of. This is also a Munch problem because for each value of i, I attach a unique value of j to it. And so that defines a map. In this way, you can think about a permutation as a map between one set of indices to another. Yeah? Also, perhaps unsurprisingly, if this penalty is huge, we're encouraging it to be very close to the product measure, right? And so for a non-zero epsilon, it will land somewhere in between. For non-zero and finite epsilon, it will land somewhere in between. So this is what it might look like. Suppose epsilon is equal to 10, right? It's just some value. Uh, then it so happens that the, the coupling that minimizes the entropically regularized optimal transport problem looks quite a lot like the product measure, right? This looks pretty much like the product measure. But as you decrease epsilon, you can see that it becomes more and more concentrated on something that looks a bit like a function. So it becomes closer and closer to the, Monge, the solution to the Monge problem in this case. That also happens to be the solution to the optimal, uh, the Kantorovich problem in this case, right? So you can see here that the first, the support of this function, uh, of this, 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 this distribution is pretty diffuse, and then it concentrates more and more until it's almost uh, supported only at this function. And so here we're pretty close to the Kantorovich problem. All right. So intuitively, it seems like it's a quite natural regularization to make. Uh, but let's think more carefully about it. Uh, let's think about things like the form of the minimizers. Um, let's think about things like uh, if they're computable, if making this regularization is actually useful in any way, can we actually compute things quicker? And so this is what we'll do next. First thing we can note is that, yes, we can give a pretty complete characterization. Uh, it's implicit, but it is at least a pretty complete characterization of the solution to the entropically regularized optimal transport problem. So let k epsilon be the Gibbs kernel associated with the cost matrix C at this temperature or, or, or a penalty epsilon. So it's just uh, e to the power uh, negative of the cost matrix divided by epsilon. Then it so happens that the minimizer of the entropically op uh, optimized, entropically regularized optimal transport problem is equal to uh, uh, what's sometimes called the biproportional scaling of the matrix K, right? So it's scaled, the matrix K is scaled on both sides by two matrices which have U and V on the diagonal. Right? And so we can reduce this problem to trying to, fi to finding the U and the V, right? Not unlike the dual problem we discussed earlier for the optimal transport problem. So these, you can tell that this pair, this pair of vectors won't be unique because you could multiply one of them with a constant and divide the other one with a constant and preserve this product. But they're unique up to those kind of manipulations. The proof is relatively similar to the to how we derived the dual, but uh, uh, I'll only uh, the dual problem earlier. But I'll only sketch it. Introduce some dual variables for the constraint uh, that the coupling has to be, or that the solution has to be a coupling, which is induced here, right? And then. Uh, differentiate this with respect to the entries of, of pi and set it equal to zero. If you rearrange, you'll quickly see that this is the nature of the solution. All right. So we were able to represent the function quite cleanly. Uh, sorry, the, the solution quite cleanly. But what about computation? Can we approximate it uh, in practice? And the answer is yes, with something called Sinkhorn's algorithm. In statistics, this is sometimes called iterative proportional fitting. And I think it was 
first formulated by Deming and Stefan in 1940. That's at least the earliest reference that I found, or it's sometimes called uh, Fortet's algorithm. Uh, um, it has several other names. It's called, uh, I'm blanking on it, but this, is a, this, this algorithm and this problem has arisen in many different literatures that don't often talk to each other. And so it has different names in all of these literatures. In particular, Singhorn was interested in, in uh, matrix scaling, mm, how to take one matrix and scale it into a probability matrix with particular properties on the marginals. And the algorithm uh, starts with one of these dual functions just being flat, just being uh, equal to the vector of ones. And then uh, this, this, by the way, is entry-wise uh, division of the vector here with this vector. And then you alternate back and forth between updating the u's and the v's like this. This isn't super intuitive to me what's going on here, but you're scaling the marginals of the corresponding matrix. That's what's going on. And each of these half steps or, or, or projects the joint distribution onto the space that, has, that satisfies one of the marginal constraints. So for each, for each half step, you're kind of alternating between projecting onto the space that satisfies the mu as one of its marginals, and then you're projecting onto the space that satisfies nu as its marginals, and then you're going back and forth like this. It so happens that this is contractive towards the matrix that has, or one matrix that has uh, the both the marginal constraints. In particular, you can, for this, this discrete problem, you can actually show that these guys converge to, an optimal, to the optimal solution, uh, uh, or you have linear convergence of these iterates in some appropriate geometry here given by the Hilbert metric. So what do we gain? Hopefully we gain something, right? Well, you can note that th these are just matrix vector multiplication, multiplications, so they cost you on the order of n squared. Uh, I don't think much about parallelizing things on GPUs, although I probably should, but my friends told me, tell me that this is highly parallelizable in GPUs as well, and so you gain something there. And this is, this you iterate, would iterate until convergence, right? But we don't, we can't iterate things uh, forever, and so what happens if we stop early? Well, you can obtain a delta accurate solution, meaning that the, the, the value of the objective that attains is within delta of the true solution in, on the order of n squared steps, and then some logarithmic term depending on delta. And if you're really interested in the Kantorovich problem, and this is, um, and, and, and the Kantorovich problem is really what you want to solve, you're not happy with this approximation we get from the entropically regularized problem, there is a method you can use to build a delta accurate solution of the Kantorovich problem, but it requires you to do some more work. But if you're happy with, uh, with a delta that's you know, non-zero, you might gain quite a bit here. In fact, you gain quite a lot. The, the paper that introduced this method to the optimal transport community uh, was written by Marco Couturi, who's a good friend of mine, uh, but uh, if I can criticize him for anything really, it's that he named his paper on this light speed computation of optimal transport distances, which is perhaps a little bold, if you ask me especially since it's been improved since. Um, so I wonder what that is then, you know. All right, so what does this look like? Or what, what, what do the iterates look like? Recall from this picture that I showed here that we expect the solution to look something like this, right? Here we've iterated to convergence. Here is what we start with, and as we iterate, the uh, synchronous, al synchronous algorithm, we eventually and pretty quickly 
end up at something that looks similar to the plots we had on the previous page. Any questions? So this algorithm is also used to, um, or, or, or it, ha it has a name in statistics, iterative proportional fitting, right? And in statistics, it was first introduced as a way of uh, scaling contingency tables. So suppose you had marginal constraints in the contingency tables and you wanted some uh, joint distribution that was in some sense close to a prior or something like that. Then you could use this algorithm to, uh, with a different uh, kernel, but uh, the same same algorithm applies in that that case. And so, if that's the kind of that's a problem that is interesting in its own right and has a literature devoted to it. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, come and talk to me. All right. So. Now we have um, a computational tool that we might be able to use, or some computational tools that we might be able to use to approximate a Wasserstein, or to compute Wasserstein distances for discrete measures. But what if we're really, really interested in estimating the, the uh, Wasserstein distances between the measures that lie, kind of, or the population measures that our sample com samples come from? Is that something we can do? And the answer is kind of, I guess. So, well, the answer is yes. But there is something going on that we need to be careful about. So I'll, I'll, I'll uh, point it out to you here. This is a result that um, has been, or at least some version of this result has been known since the 60s, I think, from Dudley's work, who worked on empirical processes. Uh, but this is, a, again, a kind of more modern formulation. So suppose you have two measures that are uh, uh, on RD, but they are absolutely continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure, so they have densities. Uh, and suppose that uh, you have two samples drawn ID from these two distributions. Then if these two distributions have pth moments, so that the Wasserstein distance between them makes sense, then the expected value of the absolute, uh, or, or of the difference between the empirical Wasserstein <coughs> distance and the true Wasserstein distance decays like n to 1 over d, if you take pth powers on both sides, essentially, and n to negative 1 over d. And note here that this is, this is pretty uh, strong or poor dependence on the dimension. Ideally, if you're in 50 dimensions or something like that, you, or I don't know, uh, 100,000 is probably a more uh, reasonable value for D these days. This might seem like it's not worth it. You can make some improvements to this kind of result. Um, if you, if your distributions are not absolutely continuous with respect to Lebesgue measure, but suppose they're supported on some low dimensional structures in this high dimensional space, then you can adapt to the low, low, lower dimensional uh, structure. And if you have smoothness in the, in, in, in the densities, you can also adapt to that. So this does adapt in natural ways, but it's still a little concerning here. The, for the, the, this result, you mean? Yeah. Oh, so, so this, no, so this, this is kind of, uh, doesn't uh, involve computation at all. This is just supposing that you had the, the true, but true distance. Yeah, 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 and you, you mean instead of approximating these distributions in some yeah. more sophisticated way. Yes, yes, yes. Um, you're right, there are other things you could do. Uh, this, this paper here by Reed and Bertel would be a good place to start. Yeah, but if you approximate with empirical measures only and don't do any more sophisticated like uh, smoothing or something like that, then this is, this is the best you can hope for in, in this case. But something that is quite interesting is that we have a more standard 
uh, central limit theorem uh, governing how the Wasserstein distance bet between the empirical distributions concentrates around its expected value, right? So this is a this is a central lim limit theorem, you know, standard square root eight, square root of n rates converging to some Gaussian distribution with some non-zero variance depending on mu and nu. Um, but the centering is the expected value of this cost, right? So it seems like it, it has low variance, but it concentrates around perhaps something we're not uh, that interested in, and that thing converges slowly to the truth. That's kind of what's going on. But it's not clear if this is, a, if this kind of, uh, makes us depart from optimal transport, you know, and say that this is a waste of our time. We've seen a lot of successful applications of optimal transport, and so it can be that these kind of quantities still capture a lot of the scientifically interesting uh, information in a situation, and that concentrating quickly around this is not something that is undesirable. But this is kind of still ongoing work and making sense of all of this in, in uh, parameter estimation, for example, which we'll talk about in a second, is most definitely ongoing work. It's uh, in its infancy, I'd say. But it's interesting to note that the regularized problem where we induce some smoothness in the solution doesn't just help us with computation. It also regularizes the statistical properties of the corresponding solution. So here we're enjoying a standard parametric rate, which perhaps is uh, more uh, comforting to statisticians. And so the entropically regularized optimal transport problem is very interesting in its own right. It inherits a lot of the nice properties of optimal transport losses, but it enjoys some of the, or it is smoother and therefore enjoys nicer statistical properties and computational properties, it seems. No, it's not clear, I guess. You can look at this paper here to see exactly where they depart from, uh, depart from the, the standard optimal transport uh, case. I, uh, it's a long time since I read this paper now, so I can't, can't remember off the top of my head. But uh, smoothness in the objective here is definitely uh, what governs a lot of the important properties of the the corresponding solutions, yeah. Right, here we are. All right, so if you're not too, too, too scared about these kind of properties or if you're uh, convinced that this kind of uh, uh, still allows us to do statistics uh, in a nice, nice way uh, with optimal transport or entropically regularized optimal transport losses, then you might be inclined to use it as a loss function for a learning task. So suppose that we have observed data distributed as mu, where this mu is unknown. And we want to learn about the unknown distribution that gave rise to our data. This is the problem that faces us in science every day. And to learn about this, you could imagine specifying a model, right, a parametric model. So this is a, a subset of, of probability distributions indexed by some parameter that lives in a parameter space uh, within which we'll look for kind of a best representation of mu or the empirical distribution uh, of the data. But note that in many applications, I venture to say in most applications, we cannot confidently say that the, that the data generating distribution mu belongs to our model, right? That's to say our model is probably misspecified. Right? When you prescribe a model to describe some natural phenomenon, I think uh, you should typically always assume that it is misspecified and hope that your procedures work well, even in that setting. But it is, it's difficult to think about sometimes. So this is our setup. We want to learn about mu. We prescribe a model. And if it was possible, the standard way perhaps, at least in statistics, would be to try and maximize the likelihood uh, um, of the data over the model to estimate the parameter, right? 
but what if that likelihood function is not tractable? Or what if it doesn't exist? What if you've screwed up your model in such a, such a bad way that the likelihood function doesn't really make sense? This is actually quite a common setting. We'll see it in a, se in, in a second. For example, this might happen if mu and the model are supported on different low dimensional structures in some higher, dim higher dimensional ambient space. Right? And that's, that's not uncommon. An example of this is images or uh, how many image generation methods work. So what, what, what goes on here? Well, the models that are used for these kind of tasks often sample some latent variable in the low dimensional space, but to sort of add complexity to them so that they'll, they'll, they'll look like images of faces, for example, you, propagate, you might propagate this latent variables through some very complicated function. This might be a neural network, probably a neural network, right? Where uh, phi here parameterizes the, are, are the parameters of that neural, neural network. And so because of this inherently low dimensional structure, what often happens is that when we map the latent variable through this function f, is that the, the distribution of the images we generate only span a lower dimensional subspace of the true space of images, in some sense, right? And this might not overlap with, or it might be that your data do not fall onto that same space that you generated uh, images in. So your training data might not be kind of in the same space as the data that you're able to generate. And so how would you try and train or make inference about theta in this case, right? Well, you couldn't really use an information-based loss because at least not directly, say the KL divergence doesn't make sense between these distributions. Or, you know, total variation certainly doesn't make sense. Those kind of losses don't make sense, but happens that because the Wasserstein distance can leverage the ge geometry in this space, so we can capture a notion of how far this data point is from the, the manifold or how far this data point is from the manifold. We can leverage that kind of information uh, through the Wasserstein distance to still create loss functions that are sensible. <coughs> right? So that's kind of, this has been um, one reason for why Wasserstein distances or optimal transport have become popular, uh, because you can uh, kind of allow your distributions to be, uh, or you can allow your model to not necessarily span the, the, the support of the, uh, of the data generating distribution or be misspecified in some other way, but still make sense of the, the training losses. And so note that these two guys are probably not computable, right? This requires us to have access to the data, to the distribution of these images for a particular value of theta. And so it might not be clear that we can approximate these. But if we can generate synthetic data from our model, which is kind of what the, the, the setup here allows us to do, we plug some z into f and out comes an image, then we could perhaps train based on this loss, which is the expected Wasserstein distance between uh, our, our um, empirical distribution of the data and the images that we generated. Still not completely clear just yet how to do this, but we'll get there. So by generative model, what I mean, which might not be what everyone else means, but uh, I mean the, the, the ability to generate synthetic data from the model, meaning that for any parameter setting, we can simulate a, a fake data set, if you will, from that model. And one instance of this will be uh, data generated as in the image generation method, where we propagate some, some latent variable through a complicated function, for example. Here's a simple example, much simpler than the image generation uh, example. It's called the G and K distribution, which is on R. It's given in terms of its quantile function and has four parameters, A, B, G, and K. And this spans everything from the Gaussian family to quite skewed, strange looking 
distributions. Uh, but you know, it's, it's on R, so it shouldn't be too difficult to work with anyway. It, its likelihood is intractable, at least uh, exactly. You can't invert this function exactly. You could uh, evaluate it numerically, probably, but uh, uh, exactly you cannot. But it's easy to simulate from the model, right? We call the, we call the PIT, the probability integral transform result that we talked about earlier. Just plug a uniform random variable into this quantile function, and out comes a, a random variable distributed as mu theta. Right, so we can generate from it. So here are some estimators that you could think about computing. You could try and, and compute the, the minimum Wasserstein estimator, which was first studied by Bassetti, but they covered only well-specified uh, well models, which was perhaps not really the realm that we're interested in applying these kind of estimators in. But this is not typically computable, right? So what are you doing here? You're minimizing within your parameter space the distance between your model and your empirical distribution. You're trying to find the best parameter inside your parameter space uh, to represent the empirical distribution in the Wasserstein distance. Uh, still not computable exactly, but perhaps a little uh, easier to try and compute is the minimum expected Wasserstein distance estimator which is uh, basically the same thing, but here replace your uh, exact distribution with the empirical distribution of synthetically generated data. So if we're able to generate synthetic data, then we could perhaps replace this uh, expectation here with some Monte Carlo version of the expectation over synthetic data sets and try and minimize the corresponding loss in some sensible way. For example, you could use the Monte Carlo EM algorithm for this purpose. So here's a plug from what I did, something I did in my PhD, which was to show that the minimum Wasserstein estimator and the minimum uh, expected Wasserstein estimator, they exist, they're measurable, pretty boring properties, and they converge all with almost surely in this, in this uh, formal sense. But uh, I guess it's easier to think about if the estimators and the limiting, or rather the, the parameter inside your model space that best represents the population measure mu, uh, the, blue, the blue guy, if both of these guys are unique, then you have almost short convergence in your standard, standard sense. But this is still a pretty basic statistical property, right? This is, uh, this is not much to ask for of a statistical procedure. Uh, but at least it's reassuring that this happens even if the model is misspecified. And if you have one-dimensional data, so your parameter space can be high-dimensional, but suppose you have one-dimensional data, then we can leverage that special representation of the Wasserstein distance that I showed you in the end of the first uh, part of the talk uh, to also derive the asymptotic distribution. And it's a nasty thing that you probably don't want to try and calculate. Uh, but at least its rate is what we would hope it to be, and you could probably, or you can use things like bootstrapping to cal calculate confidence intervals. But this is kind of the, um, I, w I don't wanna say kind of the, the most elaborate results we have about these kind of estimators so far, because uh, you know, I'm sure there are other people who have worked on similar things, and I haven't seen their papers. But you know, this suggests that this kind of uh, using optimal transport as a loss function is still very much in its infancy, and it needs brain power like yours to think about what the statistical properties are. Yeah. Right, so uh, suppose you have two distributions that do not have the same support. How would you calculate the, or that, that are, you don't have densities, they might be, uh, this, they might be uh, defined over different subspaces of a high dimensional space. How would you calculate, say, the KL divergence between them? It's undefined. 
And so just kind of from definition of the problem, you might, a lot of your angles of attack might not be uh, at your uh, disposal because from, its, from, from the beginning, the problem might be ill-defined and misspecified in some severe, severe way. Yeah. Right, so that's attacking the problem slightly differently uh, and probably involves some regularization or some, some uh, easy, to dis easy to use model, for example, or it's, it places strong assumptions on the model. Uh, so I'm not saying that it's not possible. Uh, in some instances, I'm just saying that from its definition, if you pick a model that you think is scientifically informative, you might not expect that uh, even if you've thought hard about it, that it necessarily uh, has a density with respect to the data generating distribution or that you can define the likelihood or that you could compute the KL divergence between them naturally. I'm sure there are instances, of course you can, you can, you know, uh, you can regularize your problem in such a way that the KL divergences make sense and you can, you can uh, uh, choose your models to be big enough so that they cover the space and stuff like that. Uh, so there are definitely ways to leverage information-based losses, but there is this other way that instead uses geometry, leverages what you know about the geometry of the space to still provide uh, a natural discrepancy that you might want to minimize. So yeah, I'm not uh, saying that information-based training is not possible. I'm just saying that there is this other approach uh, that might in some cases be more natural or more direct than the information-based approach. Thanks. It's good that you're holding me accountable. All right, so here's, here's just a simple, this is what the data looks like in this case. This is what the minimum expected Wasserstein estimator looks like. Uh, you can see that it does concentrate around the true values here. So the colors here represent different values of n. So as n goes to infinity, you can see that it concentrates around the true values given by these crosses. And it's harder to see from the picture, but this happens at the square root n rate that uh, we hoped uh, it would have because this is the data here are one dimensional. But the Wasserstein loss is not differentiable in general. And this, I guess, is another advantage of the entropically regularized Wasserstein loss. Because of this additional smoothness, it is differentiable. And this has been leveraged quite successfully by, by Ojanabai and her collaborators, which include Mar Marco Kituri and Gabriel Perrin, people that I've cited a lot so far. And you can approximate the minimum Wasserstein estimator using the Sinkhorn loss. And the training or, or, or the algorithms that you can approach to use this are perhaps more standard. You can, because of this differentiability, you can use stochastic gradient descent. Uh, the gradients can be computed nicely with auto differentiation. And so uh, this provides a means to um, uh, leveraging ideas from optimal transport to, to, to do training in you know, real applications. So here you have images that they generate trained on two different, two different data sets. And I think I'm out of time, but I'll mention these open questions that I think would be, uh, at least from my perspective, are interesting to tackle if we're gonna keep doing inference with optimal transport, is this slow rate of convergence problematic for inference when the dimension is high? Or even when D is bigger than one? We don't really know what's going on when D is bigger than one. It might not be. I've done some simulations where it happened. It seems like it is in some cases and it seems like it isn't in other cases. So just figuring that out would be useful. What are the statistical properties if we were to use the entropically regularized optimal transport problem instead? This, uh, I have a friend who's working on this, but I'm sure he would be happy to uh, have help. Um, and there are approximations all over the place, right? Uh, computational approximations, we're stopping algorithms uh, early, all of those kind of things. If you account for all of those things, what are the statistical properties of the resulting procedures? That's the kind of direction that I think we might want to go in. And there are obviously a ton of other questions as well that would be interesting to talk about or to, to, to do research in. All right, thank you.
questions?